My name's Paul Webley. I'm the uh, director of SIAS. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the final event of our SIAS Alumni and Friends Weekend. Um, as you know, this is our second uh, alumni uh, weekend. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it a lot. I certainly have. And you've been able to reconnect with the uh, best of SOAS. I've just come from the previous session, which was absolutely brilliant. And now I'm looking forward to another brilliant event. Now, this closing event is very special. We've got the current SOAS University Challenge team here with us. Now, I can't say too much about the team's progress, because I've been told that it's top secret. Uh, and we'll only find out later this summer when it's actually... Did I hear you make, see you making a symbol there? Yes? Yeah, that's right. Uh, we, we'll only find out later this summer when the uh, series is aired on the BBC. But I want to congratulate the uh, team uh, for making it through to the uh, final stages of the programme. That's the th only the third time that SAS team has made it through to the final broadcast stages. And I know for one thing, my mother will be so pleased. Uh, I don't think my mother's that interested in SAS, I'm not actually that interested in me actually, but she's a great fan of University Challenge. <laughs> and on the two previous occasions when there's been a SAS team, she's phoned me up every Monday and then enthused about it and so on. So it's going to be great. You've kind of put, put me up in my mother's estimation, so well done team. Um, and I want to send, say a special thank you to alumnus Clarence James Ming Chi Tan, who is instrumental in putting this all together. Descri he described himself as an extra. I thought that was interesting. An extra, but I think actually the person, the kind of impresario. Uh, and just to add a, a kind of special SOAS twist to this, we have our own Professor Stephen Chan in the role of Jeremy Paxman. Here he is. He's been rehearsing carefully for weeks. <laughs> Academic lectures have been put to one side. Books have not been written as he's entered into the soul of Paxman. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, Stephen is a man of many talents. He's looking worried now. Uh, he's Professor of International Relations here. He's one of our most distinguished academics. Uh, he's widely credited to uh, contributing an understanding of international politics in Asia and Africa. But as well as being a, 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 an academic who's written, I forget how many, but 28 books. 29 now. Oh, is it 29 now? <laughs> now you're just boasting. Five volumes of poetry, two novels. Uh, as well as doing all of those things, uh, he finds time. He also... Um, is heavily involved in diplomacy of, of one kind or another. Uh, he's been active, remains active in diplomatic work and active in several back channel, I think that's the right word, diplomatic manoeuvres. Um, he's also been dean of the faculty, when he hasn't had anything else to do, he's been dean of the faculty of law and social sciences twice, on the grounds that doing it once wasn't enough, so he had to come back and uh, do it again. Uh, also a former Savile Row model. model. Uh, and those of you who want to see the pictures, um, we can circulate them uh, afterwards. <laughs> he is a man of great personal style and charisma. Uh, so thank you very much, Stephen. <laughs> so congratulations again to the SAS University Challenge team. I'm looking forward to the show this summer. To the alumni, team members, to Stephen, and my thanks to all of you, our alumni and friends, for being here this evening and for being here during the evening. Uh, as a director of SAS, it's a great source of pride to me that we get such great support from our former students. It's your support that feeds on to the ongoing life of the school, whether you're mentors, advisors, volunteers, uh, donors, or whatever. All of that makes a difference to us. It's wonderful for me when I go and meet former students, because although they often come and tell me off about things, they're also incredibly positive about SOAS. And that's, as I said, it's a great personal pride. So, enough for me. I'm just going to enjoy the evening. I'm sure you will, Lel. Cue music. <laughs> Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's my very great pleasure to be with you this evening and in the company of our present and former contestants. When I was asked to do this, I had to plead two critical disadvantages, which I think I should share with you for the sake of honesty, clarity, and transparency. The first disadvantage was that I had never before watched University Challenge. <laughs> uh, I've since been on YouTube like a demon, so I've got a rough idea of what it's like. And the second and far more critical disadvantage was that I cannot stand Jeremy Paxman. <laughs> However, I've very much enjoyed and I've always enjoyed the way that he's able to extend a simple vowel so that it's interrogative just by saying yes. <laughs> uh, so tonight I'll try my best to inject 
yes into the proceedings uh, every now and again. But in watching YouTube and in the occasional channel surfing when it was impossible to escape coming across University Challenge, uh, I was fascinated by two things. Uh, the first was I really liked the way they stacked the teams one on top of the other and was very, very disappointed to learn that that's a post-production studio um, <laughs> artifice and that they really do sit uh, just like this. I think this is very unfair. I was looking forward to a stacked uh, rivalry this evening <laughs> and that is not going to happen. Uh, the other thing that I thought, I am a pedant among the many other talents that Paul forgot to mention and I was very, very much struck by how badly phrased some of the questions were. They could not, particularly in the case of classical questions, that is to do with antiquity, could not, in my opinion, have led to a proper answer. It was very, very much to the credit of the student contestants from many universities that they got the correct answer. So it's very much out of respect for the contestants from SOAS and from other universities that I was very happy to take on the duties of chairman this evening. I think we begin by asking each of the teams to introduce themselves very briefly. I think the student team has to say what it is that they're studying here uh, to prove that they actually are students and they actually are studying something. And I've got no idea what the graduate alumni team is doing right now, whether or not we've made them fit and proper specimens for the world at large or whether the world at large has yet to be really appreciate their manifold talents, which we, of course we hoped to develop. But please, can we start with a brief introduction from our contestants this evening? My name's Maeve Weber. I'm from Nebworth in Hertfordshire, and I'm reading a BA in Ancient Near East Studies. I'm Filippo Lavagetta from Milan, Italy, studying for a BA in Politics and Arabic. I'm Peter McKean from Wallington in South London, and I'm studying for an MA in African History. I'm James Figaro from Surrey, and I've just completed a BA in African Studies and Development Studies. Uh, my name is Clarence Stan. I studied Middle Eastern Studies, and I'm now actually setting up an opera agency. <laughs> uh, I'm Graham Ruston. I read history uh, to 2008 and appeared in the 2005 to 6 University Challenge team. Um, I'm Charlotte Perry. I studied history and graduated in 2008, and I'm a qualified teacher and work for an education charity. Um, I'm Ben White. I studied development economics and graduated in 2009, um, and I'm now an accountant. <laughs> Right, well, I think the man on the end is someone that SOAS might have great need of in the near future <laughs> as we enter the brave new world. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get underway immediately, and I think that I'm meant to say a particular phrase, which is your starter for 10. So your starter for 10, named after an ancient Indo-European people, which historic region of southeastern Europe is bounded by the Black Sea, the Aegean Sea, and the Balkan Mountains, and includes parts of Bulgaria, Greece, and the whole of the European part of Turkey. Uh, is that Thrace? Damn good, it's Thrace. <laughs> Which means you get the full whack of 10 points for that, and you also get bonus questions. So. The first bonus question, which is meant to be answered, I think, by the chairman or the captain of your particular team. Who is the captain, by the way? Same man, okay. First bonus question. The story of the fellowship of outlaws during the War of the Roses, the Black Arrow, is uh, an 1888 work by which novelist? It's Robert Lewis Stevenson. This man's on the ball. That's five points that he's accumulated. Second bonus question, in the Aeneid, who fires the poisoned arrows from the wars of Troy, which, guided by Apollo, fatally wounds Achilles in the heel? Paris. He's on a roll here. That's another five points in the bank. And then the last bonus question, time's arrow, in which a German doctor during the Holocaust experiences time in reverse, is a Booker shortlisted work by which author? Martin Amis. It's either good luck or they're on a phenomenal <laughs> snowball roll, and that's clean sweep. So we'll go on to the next question before the alumni team has even been able to say a single word. But again, your starter for 10. 
designed by Sir Nigel Gresley, which class A3? Mallard? Yes, you are. You know how to deduct points if you're wrong. <laughs> yep. You want me to f complete the question? No, no, no. Is, is, is it Mallard, the locomotive it's Mallard? On the train. Yes, the answer is yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, the answer is not the Mallard. Um, I will therefore have to default to the other team to have a crack at this question, which I now have to finish reading. So it was designed by Sir Nigel Gresley, and designed by him, which class A3 Pacific steam locomotive bore the British Railways number 60103 after 1948 and the London North Eastern Region number 4472 prior to 1948. Flying Scotsman. Damn right. Um, yeah, we're, we're not... We're not. You see, you have to listen to the fine print and to all the numbers, and of course they've got the accountant and their team. So they get three bonus questions. Uh, and simply because they are so clever, these bonus questions are all on the post-Soviet states, about which none of us know anything. So first bonus question. In each case, name the country in which the following revolutions took place. Carrying long-stemmed roses as a sign of peace, Mikhail Shaskavili and his supporters entered the parliament building and demanded the resignation of President Eduard Shevardnadze in the Rose Revolution of 2003. Uh, Georgia. You're absolutely right. So that's five bonus points. <laughs> Next bonus question. Which country saw the Orange Revolution of 2004 yeah. in which protesters successfully... Ukraine. They're getting there. They're getting there. <laughs> Absolutely right. And then the final bonus question. Uh, this concerns uh, countries that I can't pronounce properly. Uh, which country saw the Tulip Revolution of 2005, after which President Askar Askayev fled by helicopter to the neighboring Kazakhstan? Uh, Kyrgyzstan. Damn right. Very good. So we're on level pegging between both the current student team and the alumni team. So again, your starter for 10. Used since the 14th century to mean the purchase of the liberty of a slave, what word is now more commonly understood to mean deliverance from sin? Who was that? It was you. Manumission. Yeah, it may be right, but in fact, it's not the right answer in this case. Shall I finish the question, or shall I just default as it is to the other side? I'll finish the question. Uh, used since the 14th century to mean the purchase of the liberty of a slave, what word is now more commonly understood to mean deliverance from sin and its consequences by the atonement of Jesus? Redemption? Uh, absolutely right. Mm. <laughs> So let's take that as a hesitant but lucky guess and <laughs> give them a chance at the bonus questions. And the first bonus question is uh, to do with plants. That is a bunch of green things that grow um, in dirt um, on plants. Uh, its name derived from a Tongan word meaning bitter. What non-alcoholic but intoxicating drink is made from the pepper plant Piper mestakikum native to Polynesia? Uh, Thierry? No, the correct answer is kava, and the question is in fact wrongly phrased because I've drunk a lot of kava and it's very alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> but I do believe that by getting the wrong answer you are deducted five points. No, they are not? Uh, well, well, time, times have changed since I first was, uh, channel surfed. Okay, the second bonus question therefore falls into disarray or do I keep asking it bonus questions? Change. What name is given to the evergreen shrub, Carta edulis, of Arabia and Africa, whose leaves are used as a narcotic when chewed or made into a drink? Cat. 
Cat. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And again, based on extensive experience in those parts of the world, it is very narcotic. And then the last bonus question, which nut is commonly chewed in much of West Betel. Africa? Betel. No, I'm afraid not. Uh, oh. I'll get to the... Does the other side get a chance at the bonus no. questions? No. Okay, I'll finish the question and give you the answer. Which nut is commonly chewed in much of West Africa and is the source of the name of a carbonated soft drink? And the answer is cola. Okay. So I think we've got the present student team slightly ahead, or have we not? Or do they get a chance to make up now? Let's see what they do. Your starter for 10. What two given names link the Dutch physicist who gave his surname to the, G, to the CGS unit of magnetic induction and his close friend, a writer noted for his poetry and stories for children? Hans Christian. That's right. Uh, and the surnames were Ersted and Anderson, which means that you get bonus questions. The first bonus question on terms from a website. Uh, the English moot is a website that proposes words coined from Germanic roots to replace those of Romance or Greek origin. For example, or Ken Book is encyclopedia and Learn Hall is university. So the English term mootmanship represents what social science subject on the learn plot or curriculum at many universities? Law? Law? The answer is politics. The second bonus question is, possibly after the Mark I of 1948, Manchester Craft, along with Reckoner Craft, is an English version of what subject? Oh, um, Physics? Wrong again, it's computer science. So you get one more chance at a bonus question. If your law is history, what is wealth law? Economics. You got one of them right, that's great. So we'll move seamlessly on, and your start of a 10. An example being the creature made by the Maharal of Prague to defend the ghetto from anti-Semitic... A golem? Yeah. Absolutely right. <laughs> and therefore, bonus questions. These bonus questions are on poets of the Spanish Civil War. Having been given a diplomatic posting in Barcelona, which Chilean poet, a uh, communist and supporter of the Republican forces, was the author of the collection Espana en la Carazón, or Spain in my heart? Uh, Neruda? Absolutely right. Second bonus question. Shortly before he left for Spain to join the International Brigade, which poet was told by the British communist leader Harry Pollitt to go and get killed? We need a Byron in the movement. Laurie Lee. He wasn't a poet, was he? Was he uh, Graves? Oh, Robert Graves. Is it Graves? Did he Graves? Oh. We'll have to get you to get an answer. Laurie Lee? No, it was Stephen Spender. And the final bonus question, the poet Julian Bell, killed while driving an ambulance at the Battle of Brunette in 1937, was the nephew of which literary figure who died in 1941? Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf. Absolutely correct. So let's move on, and your starter for 10. What term indicates literary works such as the 1969 French novel La Disparition by Georges Perec, which are written without using one particular letter of the alphabet, in this case, the letter E? Get blank silence on all sides. 
It's a completely stupid question. No one writes novels like this anymore, nor should they. <laughs> but the answer is a lipogram, which means that I guess no one gets to answer any bonus questions. Which means that we carry on to our next question. Another starter for 10. Occurring in various fruits and vegetables, the plant pigment carotene is converted by the liver into which vitamin? A. Absolutely right, vitamin A. You see, many of us have never seen a vitamin for quite some time because we <laughs> are academics. So, having answered the question correctly, three bonus questions. In which, uh, on variations of English, uh, in which Scottish city is Kelvinside, which has given its name to an imitation of received pronunciation? Glasgow. Absolutely correct. Taken from a type of stew, which name is given to a variety spoken on Mersey side. Scouse, isn't it? Scouse. Absolutely correct. And the English spoken in which university city, as opposed to that spoken by the townspeople, was formerly considered the best of English usage? Sorry? Oxford. Yes, absolutely. Well done. <laughs> and you can tell who are the veterans who've had much practice at this. So we'll move on, and your starter for 10. Listed in a work by Alan Dawson and thought to be inspired by the forename of the 1950s actress, what name is given to British hills of any height with a... Maryland. Now you're a mind reader, it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Which means that you are entitled to some bonus questions. So the first bonus question, which 13th century document included clause number 39, no freeman shall be seized or imprisoned except by the lawful judgment of his equals or by the law of the land? Uh, Magna Carta. Absolutely correct. Second bonus question. In 1995, the controversially rewritten clause 4 of the Labour Party constitution was approved, having formally affirmed the party's commitment to what? Socialism. 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 It affirmed the party's commitment to common ownership or the state control of certain of industries and services. Which gives us our, our last bonus question. Which act of 1701 still regulated the succession to the British throne and it includes a clause stating that anyone who shall profess the popish religion or shall marry a papist cannot be a monarch? It's the act of succession. Well, you must be sure, isn't it? Act of succession. Act of succession? Uh, you're almost right. Uh, your alliteration was right, but it's actually the act of settlement. So close, but not close enough. So we move on. And your start of a 10. According to its manufacturers and distributors, which traditional commodity cost seven pence in 1906? It's a pint of beer. What kind of beer? Ale. Okay, we we'll give you that. <laughs> <laughs> but only Paul Webley is old enough to know what. Uh, <laughs> this is. No, what I am. It's a specialist subject. <laughs> it's absolutely. Well, we provide a student path for something, so I'm very pleased it's working. Which means that there are bonus questions that you're entitled to. Uh, these bonus questions have to do with flags. Uh, which country's flag, adopted in 1949, features one large yellow star, four smaller ones, said to represent the proletariat, the peasants, the petty bourgeoisie, and the patriotic capitalists? China. Absolutely correct. Uh, I'm a patriotic capitalist myself, so... <laughs> 
The star. Definitely get a star. <laughs> the five points of the white star on which African country's Somalia. flag represents its people. Did S I? Somalia. Yeah. And it's actually the only African flag with a white star, so that's well known by you. Which gives you a last uh, bonus question. Which Asian country became fully independent in 1965 and has a crescent and five stars on its flags, and these stars representing democracy, peace, progress, yeah. mm. justice, and equality? Uh, Singapore. Absolutely correct. Although whether these stars represent policies and practice in Singapore is another matter entirely. Uh, so we go on to the next question. Your starter for 10. What term denotes the scientific description of nations or races of people, including their customs and points of difference, and is formed of Greek-derived components, meaning people and writing? Ethnography. Absolutely correct. <laughs> So you get three bonus yeah. questions on medieval universities. So we at SOAS are not a medieval university, although some of our practices very closely resemble those of medieval universities. Um, this rehearses a very old argument between myself and the director who is sitting here, and this evening is not allowed to talk back. So. <laughs> Medieval universities. Which city in southern Italy is the site of a medical school dating back to the 9th century and regarded by some as the first university in Europe? Lecce? No, answer is uh, Salerno. <laughs> it's the Scuola Medica Salernetana. And the oldest university in Europe is more generally considered to be the University of Bologna. And that was founded in 1088. It received its charter nearly 150 years later from which Holy Roman Emperor? Um, no, he was way before. Frederick Barbarossa? Absolutely correct. <laughs> and the final bonus question. Which university in northeast Italy, founded in 1222 by students and protesters mm. who left the University of Bologna <coughs> in search of greater academic freedom? Uh, Padua. Absolutely correct. <laughs> And so we move on to the next question with a starter for 10. According to the International Weather Observing Codes, what is defined as a cloud of small water droplets near ground level? Fog. It is fog. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fog. <laughs> that would be fog. <laughs> so you get three bonus questions on taxation. Uh, <laughs> There's something perverse about the way these things are arranged. But since you've got the accountant in your team, your <laughs> bonus questions are taxation. Number one, what was the name of the tax to support the navy levied by the English crown on coastal districts until it was abolished by parliament in 1641? It's us. It's ship money, isn't it, I think? I think ship money. Yep. That's very good. Ship money it is. Income tax was first introduced in Britain during the administration of which Prime Minister? Oh, it's, uh, it's the Napoleon Wars. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, it's war. I think it's, it's supposed to levy the war against Napoleon, isn't it? So okay, well, in that case, well, it's, um, do you think it's Walpole? No. <laughs> <laughs> if you think it needs No, 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 I don't. Not especially. Liverpool, then, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord Liverpool. Lord Liverpool? No, I'm afraid not. It was William Pitt the Younger. Uh, and final bonus question. During which decade was value-added tax introduced in the UK in place of purchase 19, tax? 1970. Oh, was it? 1979 or something, wasn't it? Yeah, 1970s. Absolutely correct. 
So we move on, and another start of a 10. From an Arabic term meaning dry land, what name is given to the arid, fertile plateau about 2,000 feet above sea level lying to the south of Madrid between the region of La Alcaria and the Sierra Moderna? In Chavanti's novel, it's the home of Don Quixote. La Mancha? You're right. <laughs> Man of La Mancha, so it had to be La Mancha. Very good. Which means that you've earned three bonus questions. I don't believe this question. Um, the first bonus question concerns a fictional pig. So which fictional pig was credited as the author on the cover of an encyclopedia of food published in 1932, uh, the actual author being Hugh Lofting, who had featured the animal in several Dr. Doolittle stories? None of us is old enough to know no, this no, one. It's not. it's, um, it's not portly pig, is it? No, it's... I'm going to know what it is, but I can't remember. <laughs> no, we, go for we can't remember. Well, Venezuela. <laughs> I'm afraid not. Uh, for your completely useless information, and you'll never need this information again for the rest of your lives, and the name of the pig, who's a celebrated author and chef, is Gub Gub. So... <laughs> So we therefore move seamlessly onto another pig question. In the novels of P.G. Wodehouse, yeah. Lord Emsworth's prize-winning sow, the Empress of Blandling, Blandings, is a remarkably plump specimen of which breed of pig? I think it's a No, it's a You don't think it is? I'm going to go with Gloucester Old Spot. Well, it's ingenious. It's a good guess. It's a very intelligible guess. It's a reasonably close guess, but it's a completely wrong guess. <laughs> and the correct answer is Berkshire. I didn't even know that different. <sighs> Never mind. We'll, we'll go there. <laughs> which sorry. prize boar, uh, boar, a, a male pig, which prize boar described an animal farm as a purebred middle white oh. is exhibited by the Joneses under the show name Willington Beauty. Wait, can you repeat the question? What? What's the question? No, that's boxer. Boxer. Oh, okay. The pig is in the podium. It would have no, they're old. Oh, uh, old, old major. Uh, snowballs one, isn't it? Snowballs. But, what's snowballs the question? <laughs> um, we're going to go with old major. But you see, they were so close that they needed the some compassionate sort of time no, 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 no. to come to the correct answer, which is old major. <laughs> now, I do have to speed you up, as the director says. I've always been known for doing exactly what the director tells me to do. <laughs> and as we're almost halfway through, I really have to chastise the alumni team who are being left well behind by... Uh, the current students, which only uh, is evidence of what constant uh, state-of-the-art teaching on a daily basis does for you. <laughs> so the minute you leave it all behind, you fall into disrepair and you're about to fall into disrepute. So your starter for 10, try harder, guys, uh, is had he been known by his initials, as were JFK and LBJ, which post-war American president would have been JEC? Yeah. Jimmy Carter. Carter is yeah. the correct answer. Jimmy Carter. <laughs> My distinction in terms of Jimmy Carter was almost being run down by his car at one point in time. Uh, and ever since then, I've had very bad things to say about Jimmy Carter. So three bonus questions on Tolstoy. Okay. What did Tolstoy describe as a human activity having for its purpose transmission to others of the highest and best feelings to which men have arisen? Writing? Nah, art. Mm. Oh. So we lose that one, but we move on to another Tolstoyan question. In War and Peace, General Kutusov says, the strongest of all warriors are these two, time and... Sorry? Um, I, th um, I 
think it might be something more philosophical than that. Um, weather? Weather? No, time and patience. Oh. But since no one reads the Tolstoy novels these days because they're so <laughs> huge and long, I can tell you that Joseph Wright, who made Anna Karenina, is about to do a remake of War and Peace. So we'll be able to get all of these things in glorious cinematic abbreviation. So the final Tolstoy question. In a letter of 1871, what general category of writing did Tolstoy describe as an intellectual brothel from which there is no retreat? <laughs> I'll go with that or satire. Yeah. Um, academic writing. It's true, but it's not the correct <laughs> answer. <laughs> uh, uh, it's journalism. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on to the next question. Uh, start of the 10. In the 1948 paper, a mathematical theory of communication, who defined... Alan Turing. No. Oh. Uh, I've finished the question, so it can default to uh, your uh, competing team. In the 1948 paper, a mathematical theory of communication, who defined the bit as quantity of information? Bit? I think his name was Kennedy. Oh, it's Shannon. Oh. I've got no idea what the question is anyway. It doesn't make sense to me. But that means there are no bonus questions, which means that we can escape the only three interesting questions in the whole set on Hollywood stars. I know this is unfair. They've got all kinds of time to prepare themselves for... Oh, might do it. Okay, we'll move on to a start of a turn. Which fiber comprising tough, flexible protein rich in residues of the amino acid serine is secreted by spiders for webs and some insects? Um, gossamer? No. Finish the sentence. Uh, by spiders for webs and some insects for cocoons and egg cases. Silk. Absolutely mm. right. Silk. Cool. So since you're right and since you're well behind and since you need all kinds of pastoral care, which you haven't received <laughs> since leaving university, not having personal tutors who are conscientious and make sure they see you once every single term and forget your names, uh, you, you can have a choice. Do you want the bonus questions on nicknames or do you want the bonus questions on Hollywood stars? Um, uh, we want the ones on Hollywood stars. <laughs> you're going to regret this. Okay. Which actor had a top 10 hit with Respect Yourself after achieving fame in the TV series Moonlighting with Sybil Shepherd? Bruce Willis. Absolutely correct. <laughs> Paul and I only remember Sybil Shepherd, of course. Uh, so which Hollywood actor has been a member of the band Dog Star with Robert Malhouse and Brett Domrose? Keanu Reeves. Absolutely correct. And which actor played lead guitar with the kids before his first feature role as a short-lived character in Nightmare on Elm Street? I've never seen that film. Do we think of a ridiculous answer? I'm going to press you for an answer. So Christopher Lee. No, it's Johnny Depp, I'm afraid. Oh. Uh, okay, let's move on. Uh, start of a 10. What short adjective links riot, rabbit, and Chris? White. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And that's clairvoyant, ladies and gentlemen, uh, just so you understand the question. And there are some of us old enough to understand this question. The short adjective that links riot, rabbit, and Christmas in songs recorded by The Clash, Jefferson Airplane, and Bing Crosby. 
So I remember Jefferson Airplane and Paul remembers being Paul's boys. <laughs> Which means you get bonus questions. And the bonus questions are to do with acronyms. Uh, what short adjective is also an acronym for the diameter of a person's waist, the CIA's special operation force, and a mood disorder with depressive symptoms in the winter? SAD. Yeah. 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 SAD, S-A-D. That's right, SAD. And it stands for Shakator Abdominal Diameter Special Activities Division and, of course, Seasonal Affective Disorder, which we now also suffer in summer in this country. <laughs> <laughs> what name is that of a 13th century theologian nicknamed the Subtle Doctor and is also an acronym for the highest US judiciary? SCOTUS. Yeah, it is. Uh, SCOTUS. That's correct. Yeah. Uh, yes, Dun Scotus and, of course, Supreme Court of the United States. So, final bonus question. What abbreviation for a semiconducting material is also the regional code for an Italian island, an acronym for the venue of the Malaysian round of Formula One, and is a Latin word meaning thus? Sick. 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 Yeah. SIC. Yeah, that's, that's, isn't it? Yeah. Sick, SIC. That's right. <laughs> and we'll move on. Start of a 10. In the periodic classification of elements, what is the name of the group of elements also called the rare earth metals, which include element number 58? Uh, chemical symbol CE, and element number 71, chemical symbol YB. Lanthanides. Absolutely correct. Oh, well done. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't even teach chemistry here, it's so, uh, so absolutely fantastic. So your three bonus questions are to do with food. Uh, so credited with introducing regional Italian and French cooking to Britain, in the post-war austerity years, which cookery writer's first volume was Mediterranean Food? Elizabeth David. Absolutely correct. <laughs> Having published a successful volume of poetry in 1826, who produced her modern cookery in 1845, specifying cooking times and serving as a model for the later works of Mrs. Beaton? Ooh. No idea, sorry. Well, that uh, is uh, no idea about someone called Elisa Acton. Oh, so Eliza final Acton. bonus question. What ubiquitous foodstuff did the writer Nigel Slater use for the title of his autobiographical book of 2004, yeah. Yeah. subtitled no. The Story no. of a Boy's Hunger? Toast. Absolutely correct. So we start afresh with another starter for 10. Which tradition, inaugurated in Plymouth Colony in 1621? Thanksgiving. Very good. <laughs> so you get three bonus questions on British history. Uh, on which 17th century event did a spectator say, the blow I saw given, and I remember well, there was such a groan by the thousands then present as I never heard before. Execution, yes. Execution of Charles I. Correct. Uh, Charles was a mild and gracious prince who knew how to be or how to be made great. In the words of which Archbishop of Canterbury, whose support for the king led him to be beheaded in 1645? Archbishop Lord. Archbishop Lord? That's right. And the final question, although he later became Cromwell's unofficial laureate, which English poet wrote of Charles first on the scaffold, 
he nothing common did or mean upon that memorable scene. Marlowe? Um, again, your alliteration brings you close, but it's Andrew Marvel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we move on, start of a 10. What two-word French-derived term indicates a complete and annotated list of the works of a particular artist? It's a catalogue. Yeah, that's half of it. <laughs> and since the other half can't be completed by either team, I'm afraid that one falls away. So what we're going to do, I think because these are a nice bunch of bonus questions. We'll ask these bonus questions anyway because they're to do with intelligence agencies. <laughs> are you asking the most classic questions here? They're not bonus questions. These are bonus questions. So they're, they're going to be buzzer questions. They're going to be buzzer questions in the sense that, oh, I see, I'm not allowed to ask bonus questions. Okay. We'll never start and then come back. Because they're really nice questions about spy agencies. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Start of a 10, then. In 1910, who made up the rules for this silly game? <laughs> <laughs> Your start of a 10. In 1910, the Austrian-born violinist Fritz Kriesler gave the first performance of a violin concerto in B minor dedicated to him by its composer. Who was that composer? Elgar? Elgar it is. <laughs> So do you want to answer bonus questions that are country specific or spy agency specific? Yes, let's give you the ones. country. Now let's give you the country specific oh, ones. Okay. Right. We'll save the spy ones for a uh, more critical time. <laughs> <laughs> so these are country specific questions. The etymology of the name of which East Af of which East African state is sometimes given as the Greek word for burnt and face. No, Sierra Leone is West Africa. What's fake? It's Viz somewhere. Ethiopia. Ethiopia? It could be, yeah. Ethiopia? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's very well deduced. <laughs> so, because you answered correctly Ethiopia, it feeds seamlessly into the next question, which is about Ethiopia. Which country invaded Ethiopia on 3 October 1935? Italy. Absolutely correct. Uh, and of course, we maintain the Ethiopian theme. Uh, it's an opera question, but it goes to the side that does not have the opera impresario, I'm afraid. Which operatic heroine is the daughter of Amal the Queen of Amalarso, Sheba. the is king it, of Ethiopia? The Queen of Sheba, isn't it? No, no, is it Aida? Oh, Aida. Oh, Aida. Yeah. Good one. Well, that's correct. <laughs> Your starter for 10. What name is given to a positive whose factors excluding itself sum to a number greater than it, for example, 12, whose factors 1, 2, 3, 4, and 6 sum to 16? What name is given to this? Is it superior number? No, I'm afraid not. Defaults to the other side for a crack. No mathematicians here, no mathematicians in SOAS. <laughs> Nobody in SOAS capable of mathematics. No, I'm afraid not. No SOAS uh, person. Nobody knows the answer. <laughs> no, nobody knows the answer. That's the answer to you. Well, it shows why we've got so much trouble with our budgeting procedures, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't it? But the word is abundant. Um, so we'll move on to another starter for 10. Which word derived from the Latin to fly was originally applied to a simultaneous discharge of firearms or artillery? Volley. A volley it is. Mm -hmm. So your three bonus questions concern the color yellow. 
The scene of a Russo-Japanese naval battle in 1904, Inchon, on the Yellow Sea, is a major port for which city? Have to hurry you up on this one. Um, sorry, Zhang um, Jing. No, I'm afraid the answer is so. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so you're close. You should have stuck with your convictions. Uh, second question to do with yellow. Half of a yellow sun, Bachimamanda and Gozi Adichie, won the Orange Prize for Fiction in 2007. It, and it is set amidst the upheaval of the Civil War in which country in the 1960s? Nigeria? Absolutely correct. And in Shakespeare, in Shakespeare, which conscientious but humorless steward is tricked into wearing yellow cross-gartered stockings in order to return to his mistress Olivia's supposed love for him? Malvolio. Very good. <laughs> Another starter for 10. What links Malaya? Egypt, Holland, Italy, Burma, and Poland. All of them acronyms associated particularly with the Second World War. Uh, the sort of messages sent back to um, uh, loved ones about sort of um, when I get home, uh, sort of Burma endearments. Um, be, be upstairs ready, my angel. <laughs> <laughs> You are totally correct. <laughs> um, and just to indicate that before telephones had us sending text messages with acronyms like LOL and uh, things like that, uh, I think I should elucidate to you exactly what these meant. So if you sent home the word Malaya, that meant my anxious lips await your arrival. <laughs> if you sent home the word Egypt, uh, then you had a peculiar a fetishistic desire because you were eager to grab your pretty toes. <laughs> uh, Holland, uh, obviously you're on the straight and narrow and very vanilla, but hope our love lasts and never dies. Italy means I trust and love you. Uh, Burma is a rather risque one. Uh, be undressed and ready, my angel. <laughs> <laughs> And Poland means, please open lovingly and never destroy. But can I just add another one there, which was Norwich. Norwich yeah. uh, Nick is off ready when I come home. <laughs> That's what I was thinking of. <laughs> now, <laughs> such a question in a SOAS question time as we're a fully respectable institution. But there are one or two others which I think we had better not go to tonight. But it does mean you get bonus questions. So your bonus questions concern cities, and they can be either ancient or modern uh, cities. Founded during the Macedonian campaign against the satrap of Bactria, how is the ancient city of Arachosia known today? The second city of its country, its modern name derives from a local version of the name Alexander. Yeah, 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 it's the second city of Egypt, is it? Yeah. You have to hurry you up on this one. Yeah, well, Alexandria. <laughs> no, um, Bactria, of course, is the um, ancient word for Afghanistan, and the ancient um, equivalent of Alexander, their name was Kandahar. Kandahar. Okay, so we'll move on with cities. Uh, Alexandria Escate, or furthest, located in the Pergana Valley, is today the city of Kujad, the second city of which Central Asian Republic? Uh, Uzbekistan. Kazakhstan is Astana. Uh, um, Turkmenistan. Uh, again, uh, you know, 
the thought waves are getting through. You're getting the alliterative beginnings of words correctly, <laughs> but it's Tajikistan. <laughs> mm. yeah. And your final bonus question. Founded near the site of Alexander's victory at the Battle of Issus, the modern city of Iskenderum in, is in which modern country? Hmm? Is Turkey. Absolutely correct. So we'll move on. Start of the 10. Adiposis is the presence of abnormally large accumulations of wheat, which substance in the body? Fat. Yep, fat. <laughs> <laughs> so you get bonus questions. The breaking of the Watergate scandal, the Munich Olympics, the release of the first Godfather film, and the world champion chess match between Spassky and Fischer and Reykjavik all took place in which leap year? 72. Very good. Absolutely correct. And in the same year, which Japanese prefecture was returned to Japan after 27 years of American military occupation? Okinawa? Absolutely correct. Although I should say I am a paid-up member of the Okinawa Nationalist Independence Cultural <laughs> Front, and they would rather not be occupied by either Japan or the United States. And we have an Okinawa music orchestra here at SOA as a, as a subversive device and contribution to international relations. <laughs> but also in this year, 72, the Atari company released one of the first generation of video games with a version of which game roughly simulating table tennis? So pong. Yeah. Yes, mm. pong. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> so you start at the 10. Which building has on its second floor rooms called the Queen's Bedroom, the Cosmetology Room? The White House? The White House it is. <laughs> Although, if you're going to be very pedantic about it, as we tend to be here at SOAS, this is a first class pass, this is the high two one, you would probably only get the high two one because the first class pass would say it's specifically the executive residence or the central building in the White House complex. But close enough and you get the point. So three bonus questions. And your bonus questions are on ancient European languages. Oskin and Umbrian are among extinct languages formerly spoken in which present day European country? Must be Italy. Italy, unless That's you're correct. trying to trick me. That's <laughs> correct. <laughs> the longest single text in which ancient Italian language is housed in the National Museum at Zagreb and was written on a linen book, parts of which were subsequently used as wrapping for an Egyptian mummy? Etruscan. That's correct. Well, what name is given to the main literary dialect of classical Greek so called because it was written and spoken in and around the city of Athens. Demotic? I'm afraid it's Attic. Hmm. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we started this with an academic hour. Uh, it started at five minutes after the hour. And what we have done is we've kept to the SOAS academic hour because have you ever known a SOAS academic lecturer to be able to keep to time and <laughs> actually bring in his or her lecture in 50 minutes? Of course, they never do. We never can. And so we've gone five minutes over uh, the actual hour. And I'm going to declare this the cutoff point uh, and ask whoever is keeping the score to declare which side is the winner and by how much. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think we should congratulate the current generation of sparkling SOAS students. <laughs> and we should encourage our alumni to come back for the rehoning of their skills as <laughs> graduate students. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you, Jeffrey.